By early 1863, the Union Army trying to protect Washington had its orders. Catch Mosby, dead or alive. The Mosby they wanted was Colonel John Singleton Mosby, a 33-year-old Virginia lawyer who weighed less than 130 pounds, but was utterly fearless and almost uncatchable. Starting with less than 100 men, but growing to nearly 1,000, Mosby's partisan rangers were farmers by day who rode mostly at night, keeping the Union Army continually off balance and in constant fear of surprise attacks. If Mosby could force the Federals to strengthen their defenses around Washington, it would mean fewer resources to fight the main battle against Robert E. Lee. Here we are in the WNOD Trail, one of NVRPA's best known parks. In 1863, Mosby's Rangers launched one of their signature surprise attacks here in Herndon. It was March 17th. Mosby and about 40 of his Rangers came into the town on little known paths through the woods. The Union troops here were expecting reinforcements any moment. Mosby was able to get within 100 yards of the Union forces before they realized that this was not their reinforcements, but actually an enemy force. Mosby's Rangers charge. The Union forces, who are not at all organized, most of them run into a sawmill that was right near here. Mosby runs in directly after them, and he yells to his men, set the sawmill on fire. At that point, the Union soldiers are terrified. They're in a wooden sawmill filled with wood chips, and they all surrender immediately. A few minutes later, Mosby and his rangers are gathering up all the horses, weapons, prisoners, and he looks over, he notices a house right over here with four horses tied up that look like they belong to officers. He sends his rangers in to inspect and see what's going on. Miss Hannah is there, she's the owner of the house, and she claims that no one is there, but the table is set for lunch. They know something's up. They search the house, can't find any officers, but they suspect that they might be up in the attic. So one of Mosby's rangers takes his pistol and fires into the ceiling. While the shot doesn't hit anyone, it so startles Major Wells, who's up in the attic, that he falls through the plaster and lands on the floor. The Union officers come down, and according to Mosby, both the Union and Confederate forces in the room all had a good laugh at the expense of Major Wells. Two weeks earlier, Mosby and his men got involved in another action that had all the aspects of a comic opera. The scene was here at Aldi Mill on Route 50, just east of Middleburg, which is another of the NVRPA's parks. Riding his new and high-spirited horse that day, Mosby and his men had spotted several Union cavalrymen around the mill. Mosby started to charge, but his horse began to outrun his own men, and suddenly he realized he had lost control of his mount. At the same time, he saw in and around the mill a sizable force of Union cavalry. As Mosby approached the mill on his speeding horse, waving his pistol and yelling, the Union contingent scattered, fearing Mosby was at the head of an overwhelming force. But Mosby himself, alone and well out in front, feared he might be killed or captured. So he jumped off his horse, giving the Rangers time to catch up. Some of the fleeing Union soldiers sought refuge in the mill itself, jumping into the wheat hopper, which was still operating. As Mosby later put it, some of the Union men nearly became flour. Others jumped into the flour bins, and as Mosby wrote, when we pulled them out, there was nothing blue about them. Mosby's impact on the Union Army in Northern Virginia was punishing, from small actions at Herndon and Aldi Mill, the middle of the night capture of a sleeping Union general, to the lightning strikes against the enemy. During the last six months of the war, Mosby's Rangers killed, wounded, or captured a thousand Federal soldiers at a cost of barely 20 of his own men. Then to add insult to injury, Mosby sent President Lincoln a lock of his hair with the promise that he would soon have a lock of Lincoln's. 